<laughs> Welcome back to um, the last big part um, of the show. And um, yeah, welcome, Pascal Glur. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> hello, hello. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gold. Good. Super. Well, <laughs> welcome back. I hope you're still uh, awake. If no, okay. Who needs some uh, extra energy? <laughs> where, where? Silvan. Who else? Anyone else? Anyone? Still got three. <laughs> One left. Oh, you're way too far. <laughs> I mean, they're nearer there. <laughs> okay, so I hope it will not be too boring. So um, my name is Pascal Glor. Uh, I work for Init7 uh, in the engineering, and we have recently implemented an open source CGNAT, and I'd like to show you about that. Um, so I know a lot of you are customers of uh, Init7, so. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. Well, thanks. <laughs> no, on a more serious note, uh, this is another product, and uh, it has nothing to do with Fiber 7. I'll just show you a small up, video. This is our website, so if you go to the Fiber Optic Check, you just put your address, please. Well, that's going to be my address, but anyway. Um, and. Uh, you will have now the change. You know the nerd mode? So if you enable the nerd mode, it will flip over to the right product for you. <laughs> exactly. Like that. And um, so, yes, EZ7 is not Fiber 7. It is designed as a classic internet product. It's only one gig, only one gigabit. As for Fiber 7, you can have 10 and 25. Uh, you will also only get a slash uh, 56 in uh, IPv6. Vesna's not listening, huh? We give slash 48 to everyone on Fiber 7. Um, and it includes a managed CP, which is completely the opposite of what we do on Fiber 7, where you have complete freedom of your CP. And, well, you don't have a public V4. Um, so if you don't have a public V4, well, we'll have to do some CGNAT. So, just a reminder of what CGNAT is, or sometimes called NAT444, because like, you NAT from 4 to 4 to 4 again. Um, you have typically your um, LAN at home with RFC 1918 uh, addresses, then your CP at home with will NAT, and usually there you NAT to a public IP. Well, if you do CGNAT, you will NAT to this prefix 100.64/10. Uh, which is standardized by that RFC. Um, so this is to prevent an overlap with the uh, customer IP ranges. So you NAT, and then on the ISP side, you NAT again, then two public IPs, which are then shared. So that means that you will have more than one customer behind a single public IP. So... Um, well, why CGNAT? Why just not give public IPs v4? Because we give public IPs v6. Um, well, because it's over, right? <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> um, it's scarce, and it's not getting better. It's expensive, uh, and it is a premium service now. Like, a lot of ISPs in Switzerland will, on your standard service, just put you behind CGNAT. Um, that's just the way it is now. So, what does CGNAT break? Well, ac according to pure VPN, that's really interesting, uh, it seems to restrict bandwidth. So, having a VPN will not still go through it. Uh, is here to comply with fair use policy. <laughs> And it makes it difficult for customers to communicate with devices on the public internet. And also, it seems to deliver packets out of order. 
What a bullshit. Um, <laughs> these VPN providers are crazy how they want to sell their shit. <laughs> anyway, so what are the cons, the actual cons? If you don't have a public IP, you can't do port forwarding, obviously. So there is really nothing you can do to offer a public service from your home. Well, except over v6, indeed, but not in v4. Um, that's a tricky one. Um, for everyone doing CGNAT, um, this is something you'll have to handle because one customer bad behavior will affect other customers because they will share the same public IP. So if you land in blacklist and stuff, you probably have to be active uh, in that domain and, um, and, uh, and manage those tickets. Um, well, I just tried it yesterday, actually. Uh, so seeding is fine. Well, no, seeding doesn't work, leeching is fine. So you can still don't. Actually, you, that's perfect, because if you're right behind CGNAT and you do torrent, you're perfectly legal in this country. <laughs> <laughs> seeding doesn't work <laughs> at all. Um, OK, so what are the considerations you have to, um, we, we took, actually, what are where our consideration when uh, starting this? Well, first, and I told that like 20 years ago, this is going to restrict us all the time, and it does, low for interception requirements. Uh, we want a platform that does roughly 50, 100 gigabit. Uh, we want to be able to support 50, 100K users. That should be like the... Uh, order of, of scale. We want a system that is uh, geo-redundant, uh, that can do load balancing, that is kind of distributed and scalable, all the fancy words, right? And also it should be affordable. Uh, as you probably know, Init7 is not a huge company, so we like to do simple things uh, uh, that work. So let's start with the first part, lawful interception. Well, looking at the, at the law, um, we receive those information and have to be able to identify the um, customer. So obviously source IP, but also they have to deliver source port. Good luck with that one. Uh, and if we require it, <laughs> they also have to um, give the destination, IP, and port, uh, the protocol, and the timestamp indeed. That makes sense. So, okay, so that's, that's a requirement we have. Legally, we have to be able to deliver customer information based on those information. And that's Article uh, 39 of the Verordnung, hmm? VIP or OSCPD in French. Well, there is Article 18, because in the new law, or in the current law, there is a differentiation between larger and smaller ISPs. And they call it with reduced surveillance duties. So, well, everyone has to be able to deliver this information. Well, except those with reduced surveillance duties. So we don't need to. Um, well, I've clarified that situation. We have to be able to enable it. Uh, if they ask us, but we are not mandated to log or keep that information at all. So who's, who is a small ISP? Um, if you have less than 10 different surveillance targets in the last 12 months, and that's surveillance, that's not information. That's not the same thing. That's actual surveillance like copying your internet traffic or something like that. In the whole history of Finite 7, we had one? Yep. OK. That's for over 20 years. Um, and your annual turnover of your Swiss business has to be lower than 100 million uh, for two consecutive years. So you have to be above for two consecutive years, and then you're not a small ISP anymore. Well, that's good. So we enter in that category. Good. Well, next, uh, we want to have um, put some good performance, and it should be affordable. So, hmm, affordable. Well, Linux is virtually free, 
I'll say virtually, because everything has a cost, is indeed well known and used, and everyone knows it. The behavior of the NAT is known. There are many ways, it, has, it is flexible, there are many ways where you, how you can do it. <coughs> Sorry, how you can do that. And you just run that, run that on standard hardware, nothing fancy, nothing crazy. Um, specialized hardware to do CGNAT. I mean, if you're interested, just ask your favorite vendor. You'd be surprised how much that costs. So, cool. Well, let's get the server. Nothing fancy again. Well, um, we went with the Epic processor. It's a single socket. Uh, actually, I'd expect it did need more RAM, but 64 is pretty fine. And uh, yeah, just some disk, but that's not really relevant because we don't really need disk space. And um, where is Thomas? Thomas! And the Thomas Kernan uh, network card. <laughs> <laughs> Which you see here, that's the, uh, the one on the right, uh, directly in the server, 100 gigabit. <laughs> exactly. So, so let's go further. Geo redundance. Well, um, and uh, I didn't mention before, well, we consider like breaking TCP session if we have a failover is fine. So the customer will have to reestablish TCP session, like refresh your uh, real browser, and it will just go on. That's fine. Has to be load balanced, distributed, and scalable. Uh, so let's have a look at the architecture. Um, basically, what you have to do is you have to you have to uh, the, the the red line should be behind, not in front. Um, you have to isolate the customers. Uh, what we did, we just put all the uh, customer in a VRF, and then we have this gateway, uh, which is connected to both the internet side and the VRF, so the customer is forced. Basically, the default gateway goes there, and it goes through the server, it does the NAT, and you go outside. Sounds cool. Um, so how do we do redundancy and failover and all that stuff? Well, well with the thing we know, and we think we use every day. We just do BGP. So you have a core router, and that's your 100 gigabit link. Uh, in our situation, we just have one link and two VLANs, so it doesn't really matter. But um, you do BGP, and the core router will advertise the default gateway. We run FRR on the gateway, and the gateway will again have a BGP session, but in the VRF. <laughs> and we'll announce the default gateway. So basically, you can then put these um, uh, gateways a bit everywhere in your network, and they will just do BGP Anycast. They will advertise the default gateway as an Anycast default gateway. And the customer will just follow routing protocols to the next one. And if it fails, or if you have to do maintenance, it will just go to the next one, and so on. And um, works the same in the other direction. Um, the uh, switches will announce their subnet, which goes through the network in the VRF, and it gets announced the gateway. And the gateway will announce the public range for the NAT. Good. Well, now if the question is, how do we do the NAT? Because there are so many ways to do the NAT. Um, Seems trivial, yeah? We've been natting for 20 years. Everyone knows how to do nat now. What is it? <laughs> um, and even if it's only on demand, we still have to be compliant to the law and be able to enable logging. And, uh, and, uh, and we don't really know for how long they can force us to do that. So we have to be able, we have to, be able to enable this on demand. Um, and then how many public IPs are we going to use? I mean, again, so many possibilities. How much IP oversubscribing can you do until, well, stuff breaks on the customer side? Um, and yeah, that goes with the second one. Can you still identify your customers? There could also be abuse things where you would need that. Um, so those are all the consideration. 
And, um, and then the other thing is, I mean, basically you could load balance connections over the public IP. So like one, one customer opening the browser, browser opening five TCP session to the same website and coming from different IPs. Is that the good thing? Is that the bad thing? In my experience, it's pretty bad, especially for um, high security stuff like e-banking, where they don't like the customer moving his IP. They will deny connections. Some of them do. So that's something you should avoid. Um, and the, um, what was that again? <laughs> Um, yes, you will have on, on every on your infrastructure on your inside uh, customer side. You will have IP ranges, and and some of them will have many customers, and some of them will be empty. So you also still need to kind of balance all that uh, regarding the public IPs you're going to use. Good, and yeah, not all not all NAT are equal. There are many ways of doing NATs. There are cheap ways. There are more secure ways. It's all a matter of the gateway. How much information does it keep about the session? And um, if you're on Linux, for example, you use contract, it, it will use all information. But many NATs will just have a mapping of the inside IP and port and the outside port, which means it doesn't matter where the answer comes back. It will just forward. It doesn't care. So those are like the NATs where you can easily use like um, S10 or st stuff like that and like <coughs> hole punching. Um, that's not going to work with that uh, kind of NAT. And also, not all customers will have the same needs on ports. Uh, some customer will run a touring client and might open a lot of ports, and some customers are just doing like a bit of email, a bit of surfing, and that's it. Good. So, the tech-friendly way. They just masquerade. One IP. Think that's going to work? Yeah, don't think so. <laughs> but it's just one line in the config. It's nice, right? Or you could just like, as not the inside prefix to a whole range. Cool. But then again, you will have the problem that a customer might go out using different IPs. And uh, we know that's going to be a problem. So not good. Um, the huge advantage is you have a huge bucket, which means the available public IP source ports on the public side is huge. And if one customer needs a lot of ports, well, he, it will be available for him. That's the huge advantage. And um, it doesn't really matter on your inside which ranges are full of customer, which ranges are empty. Well, everything it just gets snapped. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you have to log, then you have to log every session. That's a lot. That's really a lot and you might need to log that for a month. So, mm, not so good. Good. Well, that's the lawful intercept friendly way. So, for example, you take one inside IP and you NAT it to one external IP and a specific port range. That's cool because you can uniquely identify each customer. You don't even need logs. You just need your config. Well, you still need DHCP logs behind, but that's not the issue here. Um, you know that if it came from that public IP and one of those ports, it has to be that IP. Cool. But again, customer using a lot of ports and customer using only few, that will fuck up your config because you will have to give enough ports for the customer needing a lot of ports. And then that's maybe like, I don't know, 5% of your customer. And all the other customer will just use a few ports and you will have lost all these ports and losing these ports, not being able to use them means losing IP. You will need a lot of public IPs. 
So you don't really save a lot there. Um, yeah, and that's the problem. It treats every customer the same, but the customers aren't. So still not good. And yeah, too few ports, too many public IPs. You need to find the middle point between that, but it's going to be a lot of public IPs. And yeah, that's also <laughs> the next problem. I haven't tested. I mean, I've 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 did some tests loading uh, loading like twenty thousand rules, and it doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, but um, that's a lot of rules you need to create, and you need one rule for TCP, one for UDP, and one for ICMP. So that's three rules for every inside IP. Still not good. So how did we do? We said, okay, let's put a slash twenty four on every switch. So our switches have 48 ports, 48 customers. And we just put, because 100.64 is quite large, to simplify, we just put the slash 24 on every switch. Uh, we put the slash 27, 64 IPs on 26, not 27, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's a 26 on every gateway. Um, and what we do is we map a whole switch, the slash 24, to one public IP. But then again, you'd say, wow, that's a lot of switches. Yeah, but we overload. That's the way. So basically, every switch has management IP. You start counting at the first one. You take the first range. And on each gateway, there will be a corresponding public IP. Uh, don't look up those IPs, they're example IPs. Um, so you go on, like, first switch, second switch, and you count up, and then at some point you arrive at the last IP of your public range, and the next one will just roll over back to zero. Meaning that on a specific public IP, you, do, you will be limited to that, that, and that switch, for example. So if you need to enable logging, you will know the public IP that was used. So you only need to enable logging on those. So it's kind of like the, uh, the middle point between logging everything and logging nothing. So it looks like that. Um, so for example, you have your first switch. It will use the first IP of the public uh, range on each gateway. Well, which gateway the switch will use depends on your network topology. And then the second switch will use the second IP, the third switch, and so on, and so on. And because switches are everywhere in the network, um, all public IPs on all gateways will be used. The idea behind that is just to create a, a mix-up of everything so that everything gets used as evenly as possible. Good. Um, mm -hmm. Then we had to do some net filter tuning. Um, it's especially on the timeouts. For now, we have a contract max of 1 million. Um, we're not so far yet, and we still need to test what's above. Um, we, we're not here to play firewall, so we are liberal and loose on, on TCP things. So even if a, a, a TCP is not behaving correctly, it will go through. And the timeouts, yeah, by default, TCP timeout is a week. <laughs> Knowing that your home router has a timeout for probably five or 10 minutes. But Linux has a default of a week. That's a bit a lot. Uh, and that's like established session without traffic. We've put it down to two hours, and then you have one of the issue is UDP, because one of the most used protocol for UDP is DNS, and there's a lot of queries. And if every time uh, for each DNS query, you will have a session that is kept for like two or five minutes, that's going to fill your session for nothing. So we put down the UDP timeout to 10 seconds, and there is a special one, which is the stream timeout, um, which is a bit higher. Which will, um, which will trigger, for example, for a quick, which is TLS 1.4 over UDP. Um, another thing we did, uh, there is this cool module. So what you can do is limit 
the amount of session for whatever you want. Basically, here we see con, con limit mask is 32, so every single inside IP has its own counters, and they can't go over 8,000 sessions, which is way enough. But it's just a safeguard in case someone really abuses, so it doesn't take all the ports away from the other customers. Uh, the last one, like commit limit S address, means like we do the, the it does the accounting of the source IP, and uh, and it works pretty well. I tested that, and you just hit limit, and you can't open any new session anymore. So conclusion, well, it doesn't have to cost so much. It's uh, it's doable. There were just servers. Yes, there were. Hours of work, but also with vendors, you have hours of work. It is still professional. Um, some, does it have two F in English? No? Uh, then it's French, huh? No? Yeah? I don't remember. <laughs> um, some people would argue, yeah, yeah, but it sounds like homemade and, and it's not professional. But I assure you, you have a much better control if you build up your stuff yourself. You just have to do it the proper way. You have to have your proper metrics and monitor your things. Uh, this is new. And also keep it simple and stupid in the sense like, it might sound complicated, but that BGP Anycast, this is, this is things we know. We know how to do that. This is not something new, nothing uh, special. There are no like, platforms with redundancy and backlinks and I don't know what. It's just like, just routing protocols. Well, that's it. Questions? Silvan. Uh, one or two questions. Uh, number one, uh, how do you route your v6 traffic? Is this VRF leaking? Yes, good question. Let me answer that first. Okay. Oh. Because I didn't see any v6 on... Yeah, any. because it's about CGNAT. Because I, I could have talked about CP management and everything we do for EZ7, but the focus was the CGNAT. So I'm going back to the... Uh, where are you? Yep, yep, that one. So for v6, we do basically the same. It's routed through the platform. Um, uh, NetFilter is not active on v6. It just goes through. Um, and indeed, there is no NAT range. So the, the, the customer side range that are announced in the VRF, it goes to the, to, to the FRR running on the gateway, and it's announced on the, the, the public side. Um, and we actually can't have uh, um, rules and use contract in V6 because there are many gateways and the traffic will be asymmetric. It will be. Yes. Second question? Um, just curious, why no NAT64 and uh, what's the traffic split between oh, V6 NAT and NAT V4? Because it's managed. It's managed CP, so yep. there's a lot of V6, I hope. Oh, well. V6 is enabled everywhere, so we have 100% V6. Yeah. That's also something important because um, I think if you just enable it, there is many content available on V6, so the more V6 we have, the less NAT we have to do. Right. So actually, he had asked about the split you were seeing between V4 and V6 in traffic. Oh, the traffic? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, but there was something else in your question, sorry. NAT64. Yeah, NAT64, yeah. Uh, NAT64 uh, doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It, it does work where when you're a nerd and you have a lot of time. There are so many things that doesn't. And I could just start with one simple thing. Steam. Doesn't work. End of discussion. You can't game. Hi, I, uh, it's great news that uh, V6 works. Why <laughs> did you decide? <laughs> why did you decide the, to give slash 56 instead of slash 48 per home customer? 
Um, I, I can add, and I can add uh, something on this. So the CP doesn't support uh, uh, NAT NAT64 properly. That's that's the main reason why we didn't consider it. That was the question before. <laughs> now you have to answer the political question. No. <laughs> no, I'll answer that. Um, the reason is. Um, as, as you saw, there is, there is our main product, Fiber 7. And I mean, when you create new products, you always have to be careful that your customer won't just flee to your other products, which are cheaper. So you need to um, make sure that you have the proper, proper product for the proper customer profile. And for a typical home user, even slash 56. I mean, where are you going to have your 256 subnets? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Andreas? Um, I have a question to this diagram. Here yep. you have BGP on both sides. Yep. basically had the same setup, but without the BGP. Um, and we run into the issue that when you have two CGNAT gateways, one is a failover, uh, that you have two default gateways, and the router to the left will do load sharing, sending one packet to the first and the other one to the next. OK. Um, so this is inside of ERF. <coughs> so the routing decision is taken by every switch. and. The gateways, there are, there are no gateways at the same distance. But that's a good point. Because if you have a load chain, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm wondering what performance did you achieve? Not just the raw forwarding, that's not so interesting, but uh, connection setup rate. What did you achieve there? That's a very good, in interesting question. Uh, I will answer that at the next window. We haven't done that yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, we d we need basic stuff and uh, and uh, e enough testing to know that we're good up to 15 gigabit, uh, but we didn't really have time to finish the whole testing, so we'll do now proper testing. Uh, and uh, and uh, if you're all interested, I'll I'll make a lightning talk and and give you uh, performance results or just follow us on Twitter. Maybe we'll tweet something when we've done that. But uh, uh, then Thomas, uh, what's the performance of your card? <laughs> Any more questions? More questions? Uh, do you have any performance questions like megabit per megahertz on the gateway or latency? Megabit per? Megahertz of CPU. Like oh. what CPU cycles do you need for your bandwidth? No. No. Well, the current CPU, well, here you're, you're, you're far from the customer, so you aggregate a lot of customer. You're really running on averages. Customer only, only have gigabit, so you can't have like huge peak like you could have in Fiber 7 at 25 gig or so. Uh, you can't have that here. Um, <coughs> and, and for now, we are running at like, we, we're not even sure there is load on the CPU. <laughs> I mean, the, probably the NAT uses less than the OS just staying here and the scheduler waiting for something to happen. We're we're still below a gigabit. Yep. Oh, you're first. Um, yes. Yeah, so, uh, did I understand that right? That you are not switching the IP address when you are um, switching from TCP to UDP, because if you are using HTTP 3.0, so you are switching from TCP to UDP if it's possible, and then. Uh, Many sessions would break because I saw that already once. Uh, or oh, if you change IP, the uh, when yes. the source IP changes. No, no, no. The the the, the mapping is uh, is for everything. 
And so if you are connected physically to a specific switch, you will always have that specific public IP, except if you switch over to another gateway, indeed. But TCP, ICMP, UDP uh, will have the same public IP. Yeah. All right. Greg? Well, uh, what are you going to tell to your customers who will tell you, uh, who will ask you, uh, hey, this service doesn't work? I mean, it's a general CGNAT question. Every uh, ISP doing CGNAT has this, uh, has this Sorry, problem. I didn't understand the beginning. Like, uh, for example, someone who is running, uh, I don't know, a, a SIP server at home, he, he, doesn't, he, he won't be able to have incoming code. Yeah, he has the wrong product. Okay. We have that's, another product for that. Okay. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> one more Nothing else to tell. <laughs> one more question and then... Yeah, I mean, that this is the reason, this is, also, this is also the main reason we don't touch Fiber 7, because Fiber 7 is Fiber 7, and it has to stay as it is. That's why it's another product. And uh, unlike, not saying anyone, uh, who just introduced CGNAT on existing products, and well, many of those um, allow you to opt out, well, we didn't do that. We said, that's the product, you get a public IP, and that's the other product, that's CGNAT. You got issue with that, you want your, your Sonos loudspeaker to be reachable. Well, they, they don't work anymore. Um, <coughs> well, you need the other product. You could, you could send follow-up. Huh? You could send follow-up. We could what? Oh, yeah, yeah, indeed. How, how do you handle the IP blacklisting issue? Do you try to solve it in advance or do you just change no, the public IP? It's a consideration. We haven't faced it yet. So it's, it's just something uh, I wanted to share and saying, well, this, this might be a problem. And this is something we'll have to handle. But we don't know how often, how damaging it will be. And also, like, customers like saying, oh, but I want another IP. Well, no, sorry, that's way too static configured. That's, Ooh. yeah, <laughs> move, move to a new address and you will be connected to a new switch. That's a good one, yeah. <laughs> or not. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll be yes. around afterwards, so anyway, if you have other questions. Thank you very much, Pascal. <laughs> <laughs>